the in the in the making of the of the place. No, I'm just going to give you a give Oh, you want to give it a recipe? Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. It's my uh, pleasure to introduce Ayan Seng, who doesn't have to be, happen to be any relative of mine. This last name is the same. So he is a practicing architect in India, and he did his uh, bachelor's, as I said, in, uh, in, the, in the Ahmedabad School of Architecture and Planning, which is one of the best schools in India, if you are going to do architecture and planning. And then he was here, he got his master's in urban design at uh, MIT and practiced here for uh, two, three years before he went back to India to open up what you call a practice. And the reason this is interesting, he calls it a studio. So it's a reflective practice. He does selective work. I mean, if you are in a country like India, you generally take up any work for survival, which he doesn't do. As you will see from this, like you know, there, there is a theory behind the work he does, and he has what you call on many, many hours, national hours that in India has what you call, and recently getting the sustainability award. So he does interesting work, and as you will see in, in his presentation, I hope that uh, how he has himself connected theory to pra practice as it relates to tropical architecture. Thanks, Sid. Yeah, and, and just so, so you know, he's the author of this. He put this book together, uh, Connecting Theory to Practice. And um, we're going to see these projects here in his presentation, I believe, most of them, or some of them. And uh, it's a beautiful book. Um, I think there, there's going to be a newer version coming out. It's a, it's a new book, but there'll be an updated uh, version of it, not in the not too distant future, right? Yes. Working, yes. Right. Um, but I think what I'll do is he's generously given us a couple of copies and I'm going to pass this copy around for people to look at it. If you want to, after the lecture's over, you want to look at it again, just come over here and see it. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thanks a lot. Yes. Um, so, you know, when you start working on yeah. isolated architectural projects, uh, one concern as an urban designer is that how do you, how does it all connect to the city at large? I mean, of course there's a problem and you're, attacking the problem, you're trying to sort of solve the problem, you're trying to sort of redefine the brief maybe, you probably are also uh, uh, taking a design position of whether it's going to be a tropical architecture, is it going to be modern, modern tropical, or whether it's going to be contemporary colonial. But I think one of the main concerns that was always bothering me in my initial years of practice is how does it really uh, connect to the overall urbanity of Calcutta? Calcutta mm -hmm. is a city which is a colonial city. There's a lot of wetlands and a lot of water bodies. There's a huge river which flows down north-south. There's an old core of the city, which is a large uh, green field park. And uh, there's an old town, which is very dense. And the population of Kolkata, just for reference, is 20 million right now. And there's a wetland, which has also been eaten up in the 70s by a large sort of township that came up. There are wetlands and the water bodies connect to the wetlands and what has not been able to be shown is there are innumerable of uh, ponds and little little water features which are retention ponds which have fortunately now you know being saved a little bit for uh, for resource making so at some level i was looking at the built form and the unbuilt form to find clues to anchor otherwise my architecture practice into something which is beyond the brief beyond just the building design uh, green fields and wetlands and uh, ponds and lakes fill up the whole blue green story of Kolkata. And essentially this is just a sort of a snapshot of for you guys to sort of understand how the built and the unbuilt sort of negotiates with each other. This is uh, the peripheral farmland would get completely engaged and encroached upon by buildings rapidly growing and fortunately the wetland is now a Ramsar site which means that it's sort of protected and, and this happened much later in the 80s and 90s but by and large the uh, the underlying thematic uh, premise i felt is to celebrate the blue green system which was not necessarily looked into as a as a holistic city and i think the geomorphology of the city predates the built form so uh, you know this is the green maidan which is the center of the city with a iconic victoria memorial which is a colonial edifice which is 
Kapla, right, sits on the green, green space and you can see the river flowing in the periphery. And the other aspect of the city, which is fantastic, it's the art and culture and the celebration of festivals and um, of the little nuances of art, the nuances of the doors, the slatted windows. And if you see, Durga Puja is, a, is a now a World Heritage uh, Festival. It's really claimed because there's a lot of these um, temporary structures come up over the city. So it's a city with a lot of rich tradition of intermixing. It's not very sterile in that sense. Um, and that's the kind of a look and feel of the old colonial buildings. Uh, otherwise, it's the, the urban scape is very dense, a lot of noise, a lot of chaos, not much of order, but there is a whole interesting um, celebration in the chaos. If in case somebody wants to sort of like it, sometimes on a day-to-day -day humdrum, it's not so funny. But at the same time, this is how in the inner city, a uh, little bit of art deco, a lot of these windows, the louvers, etc., etc. So and I think one of my immediate concerns were to pick out architectural elements like the courtyards, the screens, the louvers, the verandas, the cast iron grills. If you see something like this, this is the kind of a typical uh, old typology of a courtyard with the arches. And of course, I'm not getting into the programmatic details of what these are, but essentially these are climatic as well as social cores where festivals and social gatherings would happen in a large uh, uh, sort of multi, you know, sort of uh, fam which a large sort of family where multiple owners would stay in different parts of the, of the building. Originally, probably these are all 200 to 300 year old project buildings. And if you see the, uh, this is a facade of a, the canopy, the, the columns, these are, these are again about 100 year old projects. And from all of this, I mean, I kind of pick up a few of my work, which is for, you know, intentionally creating another layer to the city, which I at least hope to respond to consciously or unconsciously to the blue green system. And I also hope to sort of reinterpret the urban elements in some form or fashion. So a couple of thematic approaches, I think I found myself taking, I mean, not that I always consciously took and then sort of had all the thoughts right there in my first few years, but it, in the process of the years to, uh, to kind of practice, I think these are the thematic ideas that starts coming out in the practice. One is looking at ecological urbanism, which is how we respond positively to the blue system, the green system, creating also microcosms of those blue green systems in our projects. Um, contemporary colonial is a sort of a design language you kind of take a position on. I mean, it's colonial connected, but sort of contemporary in the sense it's not very ornate. Um, you have the tropical modernism, which is something that the region that we come from in Southeast Asia, you have the Thailand and Burma and Sri Lanka. I mean, Jeffrey Bhava is a huge sort of guru of ours, which has, that has kind of cascaded into Kerry Hill's practice and some of our, our practice. And I think one of the, one of the concerns that we also had consciously also that what is the design position we take and what is the design uh, language we consciously adopt? or try to at least propagate, which at some level addresses the macro, macro perspective, and at some level also at an architectural level, readdresses the uh, urban elements transformed. And uh, of course, that brings into a lot of heritage co conservation, which is an inherent, inherent part of the work, because I think without that, one can't be conscious in Kolkata. Uh, not that I'm a conservationist, but it's sort of I fell into doing conservation work also and a bit of functionalism, which is essentially none of this, but we also say that hospitals and other industrial facilities that we are working on has this sort of functional design component. Uh, I'll just sort of quickly go over a body of work. Uh, I'll take the first few projects which relate to consciously in terms of physical location or orienting towards the, the, the blue-green phenomena of the city. And I think the more I look at the city, um, I feel that this whole um, city's uniqueness compared to other important metros like Delhi, Mumbai, Bangalore, have the, the fact that it's it's very connected to the geogangetic plain and where the Hooghly River sort of flows into Sundarbans, which is again a very large, uh, you know, Ginge it's a delta with mangrove forests and things like that. So there is a constant movement of that. And I think uh, the first project is a redevelopment of a ghat, which is ongoing. And um, 
also I, I want to also sort of chip in that the book is actually a result of a lot of contemplation that happened during the covid years it was nothing nothing but let's start start putting work together and see what makes sense because we are sort of uh, very um, sort of you know uh, excited to do something but nothing was happening around so we wanted to sort of gather our thoughts together and this judges ghat project essentially this is how a ghat is used it's very different from how western uh, civilizations in that sense use water so you have a lot of prayer and a lot of you know you have a religious <coughs> connect you have a psychological and social connect to the water so you you use water to not only at certain cases uh, recreational of course at the same time there is a utilitarian religious underpinning of a ghat so uh, this is a this is a piece of land it's really on that main core of the city so it's right in the heart of the city in some sense and um, uh, this is actually a you know, spot where it's about 300 year old spot that you can identify so it was became very important that we actually this part of the old fort which is in the center of the city i showed you in the initial part of the slide and uh, broadly what we are doing is just creating a set of steps and the steps were also broken down so it was just creating a set of steps and creating two facilities for um, recreational purposes in terms of in the daytime and also religious purposes because this water is used and this particular ghat is used for a lot of uh, um, immersion of deity and also when you're when somebody passes away they have a puja out there and this is called amtin samskar and that puja actually happens in this particular ghat makes it making it very uh, important in terms of the livelihood and lifestyle of people so everybody <coughs> can use it so it's a public facility and from a planning perspective what is very interesting is that the city owns the land there the water is this edge is owned by the port authority so there was a complicated uh, and the, uh, sponsored by a uh, ngo so this whole overlay of agencies just to make one step and two four kiosks it's been quite an effort and this is the kind of way the water edge is being made and these are the facilities in which one is making this uh, this is the cast iron structure uh, the ghats coming down and essentially to create uh, some sort of a destination and otherwise a uh, derelict facility where probably some steps would be made casually by the government agencies we wanted to sort of give it some sensibility which becomes a you know destination of worth um that's how it's and this is actually on site in construction so as uh, dan mentioned while all of this are great stuff maybe a few uh, more images will get slipped in a couple of uh, couple of months hopefully that's how it looks it sort of takes a little cue from the context of colonial style have this louvers have this column these are cast iron grills being used uh, and the uh, rest of it is pretty standard plaster and stucco uh, the other project is actually a pretty largish project which sid has personally visited so that when i had the opportunity to take him around it's a it's a project which is a jute mill it's a jute mill revitalization and this jute mill actually these jute mills were all along the hubli river and before the partition the uh jute used to come from bangladesh uh erst while now bangladesh and it comes into these mills and as and after the partition happened there was very little way of revitalizing and resourcing some of them survived and sur some of them completely sort of died this one in particular not only survived it's really turned around and doing amazing work because the it's got great leadership and they well, suddenly found sustainability in selling the jute bags to all the macy's and the fancy uh, uh, european chains and do doing designer bags so they found a new use of this material this very sustainable material called the you know jute bags and jute um, sacks and things like that so um, essentially it's a large piece of land where this is more like an infill development and this is uh, adaptive reuse and that's like the newer part a new facility being made and just to give you a scale this water edge is about 1.8 kilometers so that's the kind of edge we're talking about and, and this project has largely been what i would call incremental surgical urban design i mean we've all done urban design in the us at least myself and some of you and uh, it's not something that you gridiron it and you make it happen you probably make a you know broad idea of what is a promenade and what is your road system and what are your basic land uses but it's a kind of a surgical way of then kind of fixing one piece 
after the others, the housing piece, that's a guest house and that's the edge and you fill this in and right now some housing is happening. So it's a, it's a very interesting work on progress where not only are you, you know, for me, this project was initially just some nice way of addressing a master plan. Then it became, okay, I'm doing the waterfront. Then it became, okay, I'm doing actually conservation. Then it's also a way in which you are working on staff and uh, labor housing. You don't want to make the same mistakes of creating poor housing and then everybody runs away. So you kind of create a community, you create uh, uh, upcycling buildings in terms of conservation. Uh, and it's not about getting a lead rating or anything like that. It's just by default, this is most economical, most obvious. And you kind of then make the whole uh, system of adaptive reuse and making industrial edges, housing and its canteen is currently being designed by us right now. So it's a whole system of um, creating jobs and uh, ecology and economy, as I sort of call it to my studio. And that's the kind of waterfront that is being designed. It's again, Sid has actually seen this live. This is a large tower and this is a facility and this is the old part that is being restored um, as, as a sort of a, a adaptive reuse of this facility to make bags and jute bags. And um, this is kind of how the overall vision plan is looking. This is the old factory. There's a gate and a plaza being made. And what you just saw is this sort of an edge, which is only this part. And uh, this is largely uh, the existing facility. And uh, the intention is also in some form or fashion, we'll have to deal with the 1.8 kilometers. And right now, we've kept the right of way, which is a decent setback. And we'll uh, answer questions on floodplains and all later. But there are a lot of these national policies of now very stringent because it's such a big project that everybody's looking into it in a place where otherwise no action is being taken. So everybody's you know, taking their binoculars out and who's dumping in what in the river. But essentially, we've tried to take care of the water that would flow through the canals and then come back. So you can't just throw water in Ganges right now. So that's that's the Ganges. And some initial sketches of land planning and parcels and nodes. It's a very dynamic thing. I was telling Dan before the meeting that you know it's it's you make it, but you then you have some idea and you change it. Uh, particularly when this a project is it's already been five years we are on it and I am I can see myself doing another five. So obviously things would evolve, but the overall framework is to address the water edge, to kind of conserve buildings, to create a sense of community. It's hard to bring in all the noble, you know, so, social norms totally directly there because there will be the housing for the executive and housing for the labor separate. But, but this is part of the culture and society we come from. But uh, broadly, these are some initial renderings. The third project is a rowing club, which we did in the, did in the heart of the city. Uh, this is a, this is this whole piece of water bodies in, in the southern part of our in city. So it's like, imagine in, it's in the heart of your neighborhood. And uh, the rowing club is was like an art deco colonial early 20th century facility. And um, there was some portion which was built and some portion I wanted to retain. It, it was in a derelict condition with very, very high profile members. And the idea was to sort of then keep a portion of the drum intact, which is the art deco part of it, and then redo the other faces outside, inside, and bring in a signature facility, which is going to be shown soon. And this is a signature facility. We wanted to sort of open up the ground, create the whole groundscape like a public space. And this structure is uh, energy efficient, energy making structure. So it was curved in a way to sort of merge into the context. And the curved top is actually solar panels. So this got a it's got a platinum platinum rated green building project. So it's got all the other little things of making sure that the water can be reused and the stormwater is serviced, etc., etc. So that's the original sort of cruciform building. And this is sort of came up as a additional part, which we restored, cleaned all of this up and, and created this facility. And that's the sort of broad elevations on both on the lake side, as well as on the, on the street side. And that's sort of, explains the transformation to some extent. This is a old art deco, which we made into this. And this is all sort of falling apart. 
which we sort of cleaned up into making more tropically sensitive facilities, and this sort of canopy, which is the sort of the signature piece, which is something like this, which then starts creating, open up the ground space and get the get gets as much as so you know your urban design thoughts are sort of slowly intertwining in your architectural practice at some level, but broadly this is actually a a perennial girder, and this is a cantilever on both sides, so this doesn't touch this actually. So it's almost like as if that gets enclosed on. This is just a nice uh, eatery. That's how it looks in the day. That's how it looks in the in, inside. There's a deck that looks in the water body as, as well as the, the lake on the other side. That's the restored uh, drum. This is how a portion of the inside then sort of sort of connects to the outside. This is the resort that we got commissioned along with a sort of senior um, design architect is a concept architect from Thailand for RB. A uh, lot of gratitude to them, largely because they made the overall concept, and we I directed as much as I could to given the Indian contextual style. And we had an amazing landscape architect from Thailand, uh, PL Design, who worked on several Southeast Asian resorts. So I handpicked them with the client. The right? client has been amazing. He's really helped and integrated in the project to make such a facility happen. And uh, this is a part of a larger housing, uh, sort of a community development, if I may say, these are plotted, plotted uh, uh, development, where the club sort of then form, forms the anchor. It's a six acre club. And this is essentially the master plan. Uh, there is a feature entrance, there's a lake. These are the little, units where the, the rooms are, and these are banqueting facilities with spill out loans. Uh, the book has more details about this, but broadly, it sort of interfaces with the water feature. Again, this is a natural water body. I mean, nobody shaped it. You just kind of weeded the edges a little bit. But again, making, making the most of these water bodies. So at some level, I'm making the most of the river. At some, some way, I'm probably making some sense of uh, a, a lake front, which is in South Kolkata. This is a peri-urban water body, which we can then take and make some sort of a resort around that and create colonial. And so these sort of tell you where my thoughts are coming from and how, how I'm trans either uh, tweaking it or transforming it and the corridors and the, again, water within the courtyards. And then you start having these uh, little uh, connects of facilities and that's how it looks actually. Um, with the landscape growing, I think somebody was talking about landscape growing. It actually landscape is very easy to grow in this hot, humid, high um, high rainfall area. So I took that cue, cue and really work with the landscape architects to sort of work on these corridors and colonnades and and create these arches where the outside inside starts getting blurred in between together. And uh, yeah, it's always nice to feel the outside, particularly when you're in a resort and sitting sit outs and how um, you know facilities and functions would spill on the outside and that's uh, probably a photograph not too many months ago probably a year a little more than a year and you find that um, the, the landscape takes over and the building and the landscape starts talking to each other in an even better way uh, another project was a government project i was i actually spearheaded to initiate the restoration of the canals because Remember, we were obsessed about the canals not working well because these are actually stormwater systems where the water from the Ganges as it lifts off or the surface runoff would actually go to the canal and that would take the wetland. Now, not that I've been very successful about this, but I at least took a piece of the canal, initiated the government to beautify the canal into at least a section of it which passed through a very important part of the city and said, okay, let's under, let people understand there's a canal. I let people understand that the canal front can be high real estate. So we did the edge, we did the whole water system. It actually, it's a flow through canal. So there are ways in which one can, it, it, it's not, I mean, there was an effort to clean the canal. I mean, there's a lot of World Bank funding right now to clean the canal, but it always gets silted again because this is really, uh, the canal really uh, makes sure that the city survives. Uh, some overall studies and this is the section uh, creating these pause points and uh, that's the kind of a vision that we shared to the community that you can have the bridge and you can have a deck and some landscape around the boat 
didn't take off to that extent, but it was the idea that you can actually engage with the place. So the bridge did happen, so that's the bridge. Some edges have been cleaned up, so these are all sort of action action oriented projects. But at least I was successful in making a big deal about canal side development, which didn't exist. And that uh, energy is carried on through the next uh, you know, next officials, next cycle of. Uh, and the reason I threw in this uh, little villa is uh, it's kind of a very industrial looking feel. It's uh, a northern part of the city. It's actually also on the river. Again, I found a site which is facing the river with um, the nice section coming down and uh, uh, all the buildings orient towards the river. There's a large plaza and platform. So that's how it is. A little broken axles. Talk about the various elements. And uh, and you know it's a, it's a it's a private home. It's on the river, and somebody has bought a land. So the idea was to sort of use a lot of brick and concrete, use these layers, and open this up on the outside in floating steps, which will make this this very semi-modern industrial feel to this place that relates to the river. Uh, to, to the river, you can see from the sides that the open decks in the top, and uh, as and the, so the inside flows in the outside. This is the photograph of the uh, the outer deck that then flows into the river and these are some of the elements of the canopies and the glass railings and the brick, the actual brick detail and what, what it does is essentially it kind of creates a modern uh, uh, interpretation of these of uh, industrial elements so that kind of starts looking into making some destination in otherwise uh, a not so great neighborhood and it creates a full sense of place for the people and sort of purity of materials of concrete and brick and glass and steel and and sort of floats on the river in, in some way. Uh, yet another project, courtyard project, one of my early ones, a beautiful courtyard can bring in several units. The brief was to design 120 service apartments and the idea was to make it in a way that although these service apartments are very small and tight, they would actually uh, open up into a nice courtyard and they would be connected through a sort of, so there's a, again, a peri-urban development, but you have a courtyard with all these little places to sort of interact and socialize and you have all these elements like balconies and colonnades and pergolas and vertical fins. And you sort of, this is a sort of two blocks created, but connected with this large corridor, I mean, corridor which is a more interactive open corridor of this this kind if you see this corridor goes through and you have these sort of landscape flowing into the courtyard and you have this is a sort of a raised courtyard for a deck and these fins allow you to then connect to the courtyard and these this corridor is almost like 12 to 14 feet wide so you actually have it's almost as wide as this so you have places to sit and interact as you move along so these units will not, and these are like second homes where somebody would just go and stay there over the weekend and have a small little canteen and a cafe. And that's the arrival uh, porch on the columns. This is how the western facade looks, and that's how it opens up into the courtyard, as you can see. That's a little Buddha and, uh, and the central court. So it's a redefined courtyard. I mean, the courtyard is a very interesting architectural element which takes several forms in various parts of the world but in India and Kolkata the, the, the way the courtyard uh, not only is a climatic uh, element but it sort of culturally and socially ties all the spaces together. Uh, some more of the project images and uh, little steel cabanas which become great places to break out and that's uh, I guess the image should speak speak about it. In that overall uh, master plan, one of the projects which has made a lot of presence felt is the conservation of this guest house, which is sort of the, in a way, the, the heart of the entire development. And um, the intention of doing that was to entertain all the buyers. So the idea was that here the entertainment would happen, the connections would be made. Um, thank you, Sid, for actually having your lunch there. And um, thank you for having us. Yes, thank you. And this is essentially that little piece. So while there is a master plan going and there are big moves happening, you have to work on the micro moves at the architectural level as well as the interior level. And I've never done a serious conservation before. So 
it was taking some help from some mm -hmm. conservation specialists, but largely standing out there, documenting the existing work and making sure that, you know, the, 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 the proportions and the existing um, elements are restored mm -hmm. and cleaned up. Um, this is the rear view and that's how the, this is a, this is a typical, typical louver. It's a typical cast iron grill that I got remade some of them and clean up the columns and it had all sorts of uh, aluminium dirty windows place which was opened up and this the detail essentially tells you the story of Kolkata's conservation so this can then carry the thought at least in a pure way and and these are uh, tiles which are specially manufactured to kind of give that 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 colonial look of yesteryears um, the, some is use of marble and I actually handpicked each and every furniture from Secondhand furniture dealers and surf. It was an excess. It was an experience, and I didn't ever think I'll do something like that. But actually, to pick up pieces and restore them was kind of quite a quite a handpicked job. Of course, one good thing is there was a lot of uh, comfort in the way the client was very appreciative and participated. Man of great taste, so that helped. This is a dining facility. I said, if you remember this, that's the dining room. And uh, they put in some cannons which were lying around in the campus and got that back. One of them couldn't. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and I also, what is, another thing I did was this building was pretty much shut off from the rear uh, in the original condition, you know, because nobody would look at the back. So just opening up and making a plaza made that much, not much more of visual and physical connect. So it was not a listed building. So that helped me to kind of maneuver around a little bit and. I mean, I could kind of wear the hat of an architect and wear the hat of a conservationist as as required. So that's how it looks in the evening. Uh, come in here and have a drink. A gin and tonic, actually. That's the tropical drink. And that's how it looks in the evening. Uh, some quick thoughts of simple urban inserts. These are small villas in an otherwise dense community. Uh, that's the kind of general fabric you see around and we sort of made a building with slats and canopies and sort of my signature windows. And that's the density if you see in the urban form. So just imagine one such building being redone. So that's a, a typical great, uh, gridded development. Initial sketches of that and then uh, making these massing diagrams and seeing how that works out, seeing layering of the spaces, your know, standard views and opening large living spaces and making the uh, terrace a very uh, social space and sort of opens up the wall so the terrace then in a, such a small tight side the terrace actually becomes a very important area for interaction and that's how it looks and you can see the canopy and the timber uh, setting the tone of the space and the, the character of the facade uh, an urban project a small tight boutique hotel 16 rooms tightly packed in in the heart of the city, again, a point where we had to make, uh, you know, that's that's the density, if you can understand, and that's the corner side. So the idea was to make sure that you make something which wraps around the corner. That's the, that's the figure ground of the side analysis. So you wrap around the corner in a way that it sort of allows as if there is no, you know, there's no edge. <coughs> it sort of smoothly wraps around this. And we've used a lot of these uh, timber metal slats, which allows the curve to happen. That's how it looks. And there are sort of four tight bedrooms with toilets and a little reception. And it's a, like a dense <coughs> business hotel. And that's how it looks. It sort of sits around. And actually, that then becomes such an important point that the whole uh, context starts looking into that. It becomes a, a little signature just by curving the skin a little bit. That's how it looks. And I just wanted to make sure that there's a little bit of privacy and screens and then the room sort of, and you can sort of proportion the windows in the right, right way probably. It's, that's that. Uh, another educational facility, uh, two blocks. We just made the facade. We redid the we did auditorium and common spaces in this project. Uh, and you can see again, just to give you the sense of the context, that's the density and you have this block sitting out here. It's a, Typical academic institution, 
and you kind of create this skin around that and and make sure that the classrooms are pretty banal but yeah to make the common spaces activated so that's how the facade looks and that's how the building starts looking in terms of creating a signature in the city in terms of screens and that screen sort of creates a certain privacy also for the air conditioning systems to go in behind these and create a certain sense of permeability on the facade that's how it looks from the city uh, one of our recent projects is a competition win actually where we were supposed to make a community center and the idea was to create a public space below and then some other uh, banquets and other facilities on the upper floor we use a lot of these artwork and this is like how the building sits on the context there's a there's a very important uh, city center element which is made and then this is essentially the building and that's 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 if you see the relationship this is a large city center facility and that's the building and you kind of create a large open space an urban space so through architecture but orienting the building right and creating this you kind of create large urban gestures so that there is a sort of discussion and talking around that and that's a, that's a cross section so this becomes that plaza and then uh, it's a public building so you have banquets and all sorts of amenities and this art actually you know when we were, when i was a child you would see this sort of advertisement when you have two kind of arts are uh, uh, two different images from two sides so initially i thought they'll be very dynamic but we couldn't do that finally we just had and this is a very famous artwork from a local artist who javani roy so we just put that up and then that created this sort of a mirror of color and excitement for people to be part of and there's a lot of local artwork also that gets used in the wall and that sort of starts making people very uh, i would say connected at some level it's not it's not like a five star facility like the resort or something but people find the space very democratic <coughs> people sort of walk in and feel very comfortable with the with this kind of system so if you see even the walls have done seams around and you have the green going in and stuff like that and this is a more like a close up to see how these sort of graphic elements pop out the building otherwise it's a pretty simple building this is a little shop that we made we are doing something similar somebody liked that so much that we had to continue that artwork even in a smaller facility like a little sweet shop not all buildings have that kind of a character sometimes we are commissioned to do complicated difficult buildings like hospital and i'm only putting in these sort of projects only because i thought that i'll ever make a hospital as a very urban design architect when it came to us we took the challenge took about 5 years to do and it this building saved more than 5000 lives during covid it just got finished before covid it was declared a covid hospital and i don't know what the architecture it's a dense project otherwise and it's on on yeah, this is if you see a section it's a it's a vertical hospital building with all sorts of ot and opd facilities I mean, it is a typical section if you see basement lobbies and these are the mcu floors and i don't want to get into the detail but fundamentally i was just looking at how all functions can get packed together with a you know cafe on the top and basement even has a has a little morgue which i never know at design that and uh, this is a typical open bed situation and uh, yeah i mean this became a beacon of hope for uh, many during covid so it was important for us to sort of consider that you no know, uh, a simple glass facade i mean of course is green certified and all that stuff but it's got the right orientation but fundamentally to create functional buildings also it's not only sort of esoteric um graphic work uh one of our we also do some interior projects i was just telling dan that sometimes good interiors also make a big difference and this is a interior for a large company called the tata it's a huge indian corporate we made their headquarters on invitation so using a lot of steel in their graphics and you know using steel and louvers steel is what they make steel by the way sorry so they because tata makes steel we use these rods and created a large floor space uh, all offices and it was the periphery and the seating towards the inside and you have this sign of this kind of jallies and screens and slats put up uh, you have a typically like a war room kind of discussion area also using a lot of these vertical rods that they, they actually make for uh, as a, as a production so tata apart from many things that they do their primary job is like a steel manufacturing and that's their sort of headquarters another facility that is 
getting built right now is a is a factory building which is large floor plates again with little roofs that make some sense and so broadly the elements of architecture of redefining corridors verandas projections i mean when i look at the array of elements that you are playing with it's a way of somewhere reconnecting with the the building elements that define the regional build form and sort of either replicating it in a subtle way or redefining it or reinterpreting it in different contexts whether it's canopies of various kinds in the various scales and types of projects or whether it's screens and louvers of various kinds and or artworks and graphics of, or various kinds of openings from jallies to modern windows to projected windows i mean so i think the idea was to explore uh, and still create a sensorial unity and uh, sometimes our practice is an analytical but at the end of the day at least the way i work is it's really the the sense of the feel and the and the sensorial connect so at at one level it's the way the analytics and the sensorial unite into a uh, uh, amalgamate into something it's not something that you always conscious about you want to be conscious and analytical at some level but the final thought is really uh, uh, a way in which you define architecture of modern india in in a way so i think the attempt is to then all of this then gets added to the new layer and in a in a world where we are all sort of designing out of pinterest often you know I mean, general practices would and there's a globalization is great but you sense you lose the sense of identity and i think as we know more about another culture you actually get more clear about your own and that's 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 the unique part where you amalgamate learn but you kind of still define your um, your sort of evolved uh, place making idea so that's the thing that's a little graphic of the studio so i have a slide i have a small 5 minute video i think if the time permits i'll play that you right yes yeah
stood out to me and I found myself repeating it over and over as I, as I was looking at your presentation. Uh, this idea of colonial conservation. Can you speak a little bit as to what, what that means to you, uh, what that means to India? Um, yeah, I'll keep it there. Okay, great. Good question. I think that uh, when, we, when we essentially gained independence in 1947, uh, the three things happened at the same time. One is that we were running away from anything and everything colonial. There was a modern movement was having, you know, sort of was working at large in the style and Corbusian thinking. And I would say in the 50s, modern movement was at a peak. Some of our most important and renowned architects were working under Walter Gropius directly uh, as a function of the larger industrial uh, industrialization and modernism, quote unquote, pure, brutal modernism, if I may say. And India essentially embraced that as being away from the shackles of colonialism and into that kind of a practice. I think globally, and also in India, in the mid 70s to early 80s, this whole idea of and of course, there's CM Team 10. If you have studied CM Team 10's work, Dutch architecture, redefining uh, critical regionalism in some way, uh, that sort of was also being understood strongly and had filtered into creating a sense of identity. And then you, at, at, in the 80s, you do not feel so bad about colonial architecture of three, 300 years necessarily being a part of your history. I mean, you don't go and burn a colonial building down, which is, was there in 1945, and then bring in the architecture language of, of the nationalist movement that started in 1905, where certain Indian elements were literally planted on certain projects like in, ba in Bangalore and in certain parts of Shantaniketan and Tagore brings in the national school. So in 80s and 90s, and of course, after the economic liberalization, and the globalization in its purest sense, where everything gets transported, IT buildings come up. What happens in India after about 60, 70 years, you start looking at the entire palette as a, a collage of opportunities. And you then say that none of it's really bad. I mean, by restoring a colonial layer in history or picking up an arch does not necessarily become sacrilegious at some level. So for me, when I use my tool of modern tropical architecture, I am kind of borrowing a lot of work of Kerry Hill, which is a fusion of modernism and regionalism. And my default language is that. Let me tell you very honestly, being a product of SEPT and MIT and 
having influences from everyone. But that also in, in a postmodern world makes you not necessarily against or alien to heritage conservation or making an arch in a project. You know, there was a phase in my life and in our contemporaries that you will not even make an arch. You were so sacrilegious in terms of being pastiche. You know, oh my God, I will interpret an arch while not make an arch. So in my practice, I think I have been able to, if I take the case of three of the cards that uh, Dan is holding, one of them is uh, a modern tropical architecture. That's in, in case of Nirvana, some of my housing villas or something. But at the same time, I'm not necessarily shy from making my little arches, which I call contemporary colonial. I'm saying contemporary colonial, which means like I would take colonial to whatever little extent, garnish it a little bit, but not try to make a, you know, I'm not trying to recreate a colonial architecture by any means because I can't, I don't even have the wherewithal to create 17 inch, 18 inch walls and create uh, uh, 18, uh, 18 feet ceiling or whatever that is in meters, but I mean that high wall, uh, high ceilings, it will not even suffice. I mean, nobody's going to allow me to make it today. But I think that Kolkata is a colonial city. It was the British capital. Today, when I see the city in a lens, it has a rich array of, you know, warehouses and uh, possibilities of adaptive reuse. And, uh, you know, you should not be um, sacrilegious or that I'm not going to take this because I think we have comfortably away from that. And particularly somebody who understands America, I think that was also my little America bit, you know, being living in DC, working on the Basilica of Baltimore with Bia Blinder Bell or working on the old post office. I mean, you kind of almost say that, you know what, I can't be so anti all of this. It's humanism that you probably attack. You attack you attack regionalism in its sensibility, not be right-winged about relig uh, regionalism. You know, that, you know what I mean? Right-winged doesn't be protective about my cultures because our cultures are unifying everybody together across globes. But at the same time, you want to go and see in India. You want to go and see a Baltimore in India. You see what I'm saying? You want to understand the country, have Indian food, enjoy the taste, not in the American version of Tandoori chicken. You see, you want the Indian version of tandoori chicken, as long as that doesn't get to, uh, uh, you know, spiced up. So I'm saying that I think the, the, the beauty of today's context that we work in, in multiple points, and particularly some of us who've had the opportunity to, to be uh, in this part of the world as much and, you know, have uh, emotional and, and emotional and real connects to projects, departments, friends, you know, I think that we are much more in a in a comfortable position to make our choices without getting stuck up into oh my god is that is that the British hangover not gotten over us? That's my uh, long answer to your short question. That, that does work. That works. And Thank I, you. I think I can use that because that, that's something I was wrestling with. Was just even your perspective on it. I think you definitely answered it. So. By default, I'm a tropical modernist. So yeah. We had some other questions. We had a question in the back there. There was a question in the back there. Yes, it was me. Hi. Hello, how are you? Thanks. I really, I really enjoyed your presentation. Thank you for being here and presenting to us. That was um, amazing knowledge. Um, do you think you're playing um, an impactful role on the transformation of Indian architecture as you move away from colonial architecture? Yes, I think I think we are moving away from colonial architecture to the extent that we are redefining when we get the opportunity to. But it, it is so when, I, when I'm at, at the same time, when I'm creating a project like the Ibiza Resort or when I'm kind of doing a restoration project, which is a conserving a 200 year old building, I uh, I'm, I'm respecting the architecture. I'm, I'm transforming the architecture into contemporary colonial. Contemporary colonial means you're taking the architectural stylistics, which is a very fusion of colonialism and tropical architecture. You see a lot of that in Burma and Sri Lanka and Bawa's work and, you know, all of that. So that's that's a, that's a, that's a take you can take. It's not that every building has to be has to be that. Right. But I think the beauty is that 
I, I'm still, you know, pretty young. We just had a 15, 20 year old practice. So we're still exploring. We don't have to get etched in stone. We, we have in, in my array of projects, I have hospitals. I can't make arches in the hospitals unnecessarily. I don't want to make my tropical resort so sterile that Dan comes and says that it's nothing, nothing difficult. It, it could be in Baltimore. So that's also important to kind of embrace the tropics within where you can, you know, sit outside and you can sort of have a, have a nice drink and it's the outside comes on the inside. So it's a little more, more space making where you use your verandas and your screens, you know, that kind of stuff. So I think, I think it's more about how much of what you do. Does that answer your question to a second? Yeah. Thank you. Yes. So you use the word collage, and the one thing that, that jumped out to me is your work is wide ranging, you know, different scales, different typologies. Um, it, it seems like everything is just different. So how do you navigate that with clients in a world that, at least in the American world, is that demands the specialist, demands the person that's done, or demand the firm that's done, you know, twenty eight schools of architecture, or fifteen firehouses, or so I think I think uh, uh, I just have to give you a different context to this. I think uh, the city that I practice in. Um, the, okay, so the honest answer is that if you, I have to also give you a sequence of work. So you kind of present yourself that you're from MIT and you are essentially a process-driven architect, a process where I'm going to work with you, understand your problem, and I'm going to answer your problem with your needs and craft it in an interesting way that comes about it. So I have all these tools of way of working within me. You're also sort of begging for great work, honestly speaking. You're not, you're not like in a position that I am the housing architect, or I am the resort architect, or I can. So in a way, you have to maneuver yourself for planning, design, architecture. So all of it. That's it's a lot of work. But you also sort of take interesting stands when it comes to exploring, <coughs> and you don't want to get you know, sort of stereotyped into, oh, this guy. So when I made the resort, fortunately, the service apartment is also I was making. And the, the club came to me and said, yeah, okay, he can sort of work on. So it was good architecture with great process that I was trying to push for rather than a product typology. And uh, in an emerging market situation, well, a lot of buildings are happening, but necessarily not. I mean, I beg to say that 90% is a lot of, a uh, lot of noise in this generally. So we want to be able to push quality work, quality deliverables, whatever little bit you do, it make it, it, it represents the project. There's a, a lot of you in it, but it's subservient to that. And you don't, I'm so it's just circumstances maybe, and it's just the way it happened. So obviously I've been committed now. I'm doing, so the Opus Hotel came and people say, okay, you can, you can do a hotel, get, get me another hotel done. And, you have to also realize in 15 years, two projects take like five to five plus six, seven. So you're, you're done with that. Uh, somebody's now come in like six months ago, I'm doing a housing who was working on the Nirvana housing team. And he's now set up his own little company. And he's called me that I loved your Nirvana housing. So you come and do housing for me now. So if you see not much housing I had done, I have just one other example of housing in the book. So there's 120 unit very nice and it's completely my take so i'm going more modern tropical this time so so i mean just 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 give you an example so so yes you get piggybacked into entities if you see i have not done much high rise projects so i'm not a little away from that maybe tomorrow if somebody comes i'll have to do that also but i guess i'm trying to talk about uh, uh, myself as and the practice as somebody who connects theory to practice somebody kind of works on design projects, somebody who teaches and who runs studios in the various parts of the country, uh, has an academic mind, love to spend time with young people and run a studio and a, run, a, run a practice of a dozen plus people. Uh, very easy to be like the resort retail guy and very easy to get blocked into the villa guy. But I guess it's not happened before. But since 20 years have passed, another 20 will somehow I managed to negotiate. So it sounds like you're working with some pretty exceptional clients that you, you, you've, I, yeah, uh, you've honed the business sense. So you've, you've got these clients who are giving you this, this kind of 
freedom to reimagine. Also, what has happened is, I mean, I don't want to brag on this one, but I guess in you know, we have, we are one of the top firms in Eastern India. We got a lot of awards. So when you get two awards, I, I told you this before. When Professor Doshi came to my office in my small little place when I had like three or four or five people, he said they just do. I was like concerned about what do I do when I, you know, I'm, I'm back here and I'm struggling on one project, which is. So I was told like, do two good projects first. Just just do two good projects, and I just put my head down. And just to give you a sense of timeline, I went back to I I, I flew out of Dallas in 2005. Uh, office it says you get a computer and things set up. Couple of years more than I thought. I was more American than Indian for sure, for sure. And everyone, why did you come back from Washington D.C.? So then I, you know, I mean, everybody found it very funny that I wanted to do some good stuff in India. What are you doing? So you have to actually convince yourself back to your own people to say that yeah, I want to do some good stuff. So that you sort of put your head down and you kind of do that one resort and one service apartment proper and you do a friend's villa. So some of my clients are sort of, you know, very accomplished bankers or some friends who would say, you will take me a project, man, I'll do your villa. We went to school together. I mean, so, you know, you get in that mode and then somebody has a drink on the on the terrace of that villa. And said, this is nice. This is very nice. I want you to do my villa. So I, I think that sort of goes on the villa side. The uh, chairman of the of the Bengal Rowing Club, after working on one phase, got me into doing the the large industrial project. And so obviously, in that project, there is one restoration. I've never done restoration, and this guy said that I believe you will be able to do it. I don't want anybody else to do it. It's fine. I I, I learned our restoration. I called some restoration friends. Hey man, I'm actually supposed to restore a building. I said, why to do it? So I mean, do I use the same material? Fortunately, it wasn't listed, so I could I could move around a little bit. I could like break a few walls and do exactly what I want. I made sure that I don't break too many things. Uh, but yeah, I, I guess the the answer is that uh, it's been very challenging to a set up a studio in India and do good work. To do anything is not a problem. I could do it tomorrow. Then to kind of not only do, so just to give you a timeline, the first two projects or three projects took me 10 years and the rest of it is the next end. So just to sort of get you a scale of the momentum, you pick up and you start transforming. And of course, uh, as I shared before, I started by working on this book. It was just supposed to be a coffee table, image gathering document, trying to get my mind sorted in COVID when the world was falling apart and I lost my mom. So. This book is dedicated to my parents and they put me through school, which is very hard in Indian conditions. So I, I kind of like was sorting that out also. It was the book was a method that you know way to heal my thought processes. And then my professor from MIT, who all of you know, Besh Sanyal, wanted to sort of see this, and Brent and Sid came in and they said, hey, that's amazing stuff you're doing. So I said, okay, Bish is writing the preface. So my other uh, academic Friends from who teach in college, pretty much like you guys, uh, they wanted to write in and say, support this uh, crusade that we are doing of quality work. And they sort of said, yeah, let me write a few lines, uh, what they feel honestly, uh, hopefully honestly. And, uh, and it's sort of built into the book, which, which is what you see. And um, you know, I'm very happy to be able to come here because of said and talk to you guys and share some thoughts. I did something similar in MIT last week, which was also uh, very well connected and I think that it sort of tells you that theory and practice are connected you can take theoretical positions and you can you can make projects happen with a lot of detail and construction and I mean good work doesn't mean like yapping on design but you really work on in intense working drawings service drawings create schedules create for charts for the contractor it's not in your brief it's not in your scope but to just make your life easy you make for charts and say that, can you just give me a list of deliverables that you need? So in a way, you're almost trying to sort of guide the otherwise disorganized construction fraternity for your own benefit, actually, not for anybody else, so that you can get sign-offs and you can get GFCs in. So for each project, we make hundreds of drawings, hundreds of drawings. And then the contractor says that, wait, drawings, man, can you explain the side, what's the height of that? Yeah. So it's, 
don't know. Like great drawings, but I don't have the time to look into the drawings. If you come in and spend one hour with me, I'll figure everything out. I said, okay, whatever. Is so, there anything? Oh, go ahead. Yes. Yes. So my final question would be, with your portfolio quality work, do you find it hard to compete with companies for projects when there is a lot of noise within our urban centers like DC and Washington DC, when clients aren't necessarily looking for quality work all the time? Do you find it hard to compete in America with all the noise? Oh, well, I'm not competing in America currently. Okay, so do you find it hard to compete in India? So, I mean, when I'm currently working in India, yes, we find hard to compete. But you see, uh, the decision is to have a design studio and not a factory. So that's the first call. If you have a, I mean, I have worked in Boston for, I, I, when I was working in Washington, D.C. in Bible in the Bell, it was an eight-person office and we were cranking Anacostia Water for initiative. I was cranking three open design projects alone. Alone. With one kid who was doing one graphic. So I don't think it's about it's about people, it's about also it's a resource planning issue. I think you've taken a conscious stand that you run a studio of a dozen plus people. So you know you can maneuver, you don't need a whole bunch of work to survive. You need, I mean, I have I have currently I'm working on 15 odd projects, which range from a housing project to a crematorium design to this ongoing uh, you know this industrial master plan. Uh, we're working just started to scribble on a campus and we would have one or two people to handle that. So I think that is there. I mean, uh, that's always there. And and then if, if things change, you have to be dynamic and you have to be agile. I mean, if tomorrow somebody says that, okay, you are, I mean, I'm, I'm not the guy who make 200 million square feet and turn it around and probably, uh, you know, do a, do a joint venture with one, one of these commercial architecture firms. They still would Keep me as a design lead. That's that's the difference. So you kind of position yourself as a design lead, and you kind of keep your construction documentation, maybe if required, for a firm that, that can do that. So uh, I don't know. I mean, as of now, it's okay. I mean, I work for a few more, for a little more time for sure, and then we'll see how it takes us. Thank you. I I have one question. So how was your MIT education useful in India? <laughs> Or was it, or did you have to re-adapt yourself completely? Uh, well, I think uh, you, you essentially uh, get yourself, you get expectations out of yourself a little higher than you can deliver. That's one thing for sure. I think the interdisciplinary approach of the course, course package I took at MIT, or which is what I believe in, which is you know, urban design, architecture, planning, and construction all sort of fuses together in a way. And actually, I, I to, for a few, I actually specialized in uh, real estate studies also at MIT. And I took CRE courses, I urban design for enough. So this pro program is fused between architecture, urban design, and real estate. And uh, real estate does not always mean that you will become a for-profit developer. It's somewhere used to, used to counter the for-profit developers because you know the numbers better than they do. And you can show what's value versus what is... Uh, what is you know i can tell them that this design is going to give you a better irr than this one and so they suddenly figure out that you're talking their language and they're foxed and so you don't teach me profitability i make you better profit although i don't use it too much so say i think interdisciplinary understanding is a strong level of thinking i think multitasking on this multiple projects on a variety has been definitely a tool I think just having an academic bent and appreciating academia is also important for me. Otherwise, I wouldn't be here doing all this stuff. I'll be picking up another project and turning it around, right? I mean, mm -hmm. I think what you want to give your time to in, in our lifetime is important for us to acknowledge. I think everybody in the room has that bent, and that's why we are here. If you've been a very commercial architect, you would just go and, you know, doing joint ventures with companies to bring the next big big deal. Um, that doesn't mean that we are not profitable. Obviously, we are kind of, we make things happen. So, so yeah, I mean, I, does that sort of answer your question? Yeah. Fred has a question yes. here. Oh, I mean, you've kind of touched on it uh, in a number of ways, but I, I, I'm really fascinated by the work, by the way. It's just really 
volatile and, and lovely at so many scales. But uh, I wanted to ask because there's a there's a practice class here. Um, if there's anything striking, as somebody who practices who has practiced on multiple continents, is there anything striking about the difference between practicing in India and practicing in North America? I think that uh, if I if I wear my hat as an architect, I have to understand that North America also has regional regions. It has the hot, dry area. I have my friends who used to teach at ASU and you know that part of the world, South Southern California. They they think in a certain way. The guys who are down in Florida or you know New Orleans, they think in a different way. It, it's it's really climate that also creates regions. So when I actually started interacting with the Thai architects, I found that there is a better synergy in architectural understanding. You know, some of you guys must have been to Thailand and gone to a fancy Thai resort. I mean, that appeals to me, and it seems that you know, not the architecture, but the general planning and design language is something where the hot, humid zone of India can connect to better. Whereas the hot, dry part of the country connects to the Arizona story better. You know, so in a way, I would tell a guy, "Are you going to practice in Delhi? Are you going to practice in Delhi? Okay, go to Arizona. Don't go anywhere else." So, in some way, in, in architecture creates these sub sub zones. So, but in terms of a practice, um, I think I have learned a lot of quality documentation, organization, structuring. You know, that structuring that helps me to multitask in a small team. I insist that I have a small team, so I have my, you know, like when I teach a studio, I don't have a huge class. I have a smaller, you know, faculty student ratio kind of a thing. So I studio also. I have, you know, I can handle. I can have my pause on all the projects that I have to do. Okay. Not every day, but definitely a couple of times in the week. So in a way, I could, you know, sort of handhold the dozen plus two projects. So earlier I'm doing a villa. Now I'm doing a housing. Earlier I did one institutional building, now I'm going to make a campus of 10 of them or 8 of them. So in a way, I know I'm scaling up. I know I might need two guys instead of one guy. Maybe I have to sort of grow a little bit. But but I think that the structuring of an American office is fantastic. The order, the organization, the, the folder management. I mean, I, I remember I spent so much of time in folder management and so naming a drawing. And, and these little uh, ugly but sort of painful details I made a, you know, when I had no work, I made a huge uh, way you will go to work here, you know. Mm -hmm. SOPs. SOPs, like, very, very important. Yes. Well, Indian, young Indian guys, are like, what the hell is all this nonsense, man? <laughs> so, you know, give me the design. I said, no, and look at the SOPs, write the MOMs. <laughs> what is an MOM? Minutes of meeting. What is a GFC? Do it for construction. Stamp it, sign it, make nice cover sheets. This is all my American learning. You know, sorry, just, uh, you know what I mean to say is that an organized approach can really help one to practice in an otherwise noisy, disorganized, chaotic environment. Where the clients are like, give me the drawing, make this change. Oh, uh, the guy is running with the side. The contractor is yeah, yeah. running helter skelter. It's like a, it's like a mayhem in the site. And when I would come in with my set of drawings, and I would fall at my feet, sir, 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 please explain me this. What is happening here? Can you tell me this line is going? I said, yeah. Take out your drawings, man. So, oh my God, it's right here. And yeah, nobody gave me that drawing. <laughs> then I would explain that, look, man, look at this drawing. In fact, to the organization also keep your own sanity. Because all these guys are like, okay, please tell me where is the line going to go? How many lights? Okay, one, two, three, four, just keep the lights. Where is the beam? Then you, you know, you, you would not, I mean, there's a, and they're very good at it. They are, they're very good at it. You can you can work without doing any drawings. They can do just one drawing. And I unfortunately have been taught by some great masters who have also had the rigor of making drawings. So I, I so whatever little fees I get in a project, I make sure that you know the drawings are rigorously done. Basic sets are there. And I think although I'm not so tech savvy, but you know we are using Revit and general software like SketchUp, Photoshop, and Decent stuff. So uh, I think I, I think that the organizational aspect is important. The phased project, the design process is important. Uh, a bit of my undergrad education from Ahmedabad School also helped. It's a great school where I'm also visiting faculty. So uh, uh, 
and a bit of that is intuitive. So you run a design studio. I, I think handling a dozen people and, you know, like a dozen plus projects is not that hard yet, but it will be if I expand a little bit, but then the hierarchy starts coming in and that's the, that's where it gets, mm -hmm. it gets tricky because simple instructions don't percolate. It's all about decisions and instructions and loose decisions on the phone. And now with video call, it's like, don't bother, just give me a decision. And you have to actually, you know, based on circumstances, some, some, sometimes do a video call and take a call at sight. So sometimes things are not all that great, but yeah, we are, we are also learning on the process. A question for students, you know, we're, we're about to enter, some of us are already in the workforce. Um, do you have any advice for when we start to look for jobs, start to place ourselves in firms uh, of how to put our best foot forward or from you, your perspective, when you're looking at resumes or you're looking at portfolios, what connect, what drives you to a student? What drives you to an applicant? Um, what are you looking for in your future designers on your team? I think that uh, if you are a great learner, because at no given time, you know everything. I think the, when I'm hiring some kids, when I go back and there are some applicants, it's a turnover. A lot of my kids go to grad schools and so I need to bring in kids. So I think that, of course, there are some basic software someone needs to know. And this is, I, I think it's for starts. I've crossed that point where I'm sitting on the autocad and doing drawings every day. <coughs> so um, I think that, that the guys need to sort of at least be decent on softwares. Um, they need to be in a desire to learn. I think one of the great things of my undergrad program in architecture, and sorry for my Hindi maybe, you know, there is a whole Guru Shish Parampara in architecture language we are working, which is the, you know, if you have like a professor, you learn from it. You know, it's a craft. It's not computer science where you get a gun flow course and it's done on the website and it doesn't work in architecture. I think. It just, it's very hands-on and you need to spend more time. I think studio is, that's why studios are there for. You uh, you read between the lines in a way, in, in figuring out space making. Nobody can teach you good sections. You have to, so you remember Matrix, you just know it. You just, you just know it. You, you don't, I, I cannot draw a good elevation or see, professor cannot draw an elevation. You have to sort of, okay, this is right. That that thing has to sort of develop and that desire to get to that point is important. Then I think it's a matter of, you know, which vertical you're choosing, you have to do it in a large firm. Uh, a large firm, uh, and the only thing I guess a large firm is if you, it's what, what your team is. And of course, the initial years in the US, I know it's very uh, ground up. So sometimes you don't get to design until much later and part of a large team and that's sort of frustrating at times which I do not like too much. So I like to have my smaller team and people are very close to the design. So you need to choose whether you want to be a small fish in a big pond or a big fish in a small pond. And I think that scale is very important. So not to undermine any of the big guys but as a young graduate you, when you join a big firm, it will take you longer to get to that point. But if, well, I had the privilege of working for a big firm like Biabin the Bell, but their DC office had only like six, seven people after, four, after 2001 when I graduated. So it was a small team, I didn't learn something. I went and worked in Pittsburgh for a firm in the waterfront. Again, like a dozen person office. So I've never enjoyed very large setups where I'm too far from the principles. Not that my friends are not by some of my colleagues who stayed on in the US and they probably reached the point after 10 years and they are now partners after 20 years I have some projects that are also doing great work but I'm saying it's it's I can't compare I won't criticize some other path but I think the your proximity to your mentor is important and which layer are you in particularly in architecture if it would have been a coding team you would not really, really care if you're doing a part so Thank you so much, Ryan, for coming. Great questions. Great Thank you. Good conversation.
Okay, so, so let's get a picture of you and him.